Uh, like Mbumi mentioned, uh, we're starting a brand new series uh, today, one that I am particularly excited about. Um, it's one of those that, uh, that we'll, we'll walk uh, through this series over the next couple of weeks, but we'll continue to come to it over and over again uh, over the years, Lord willing. Uh, it's just one of those that I don't believe it has an end. Um, it's one of those that we continue to grow in uh, week after week, day after day. And we've simply titled it, We Are All Theologians. All right? We are all theologians. And we've titled it that way because that is a true statement, uh, especially if you are a Christian, if you've crossed the line of faith, if you look to Jesus as Lord and Savior, then you are a theologian. It's not just for people like myself, people uh, who come up every Sunday and preach God's word. It's not for people who are in what we call full-time ministry. Um, I don't like that phrase, but I'll use it for the sake of this conversation. It's not just for those people. It's not for the, those who are academics, who teach in seminaries and Bible schools. No, no, no. If you are a Christian, then you are a theologian, that you are one who is on pursuit of wanting to know more and more about God and his word because it has massive implications for our lives. And so we're going to be tackling quite a few things in this series. Uh, we're going to be looking at doctrines, uh, some like sanctification and predestination and election. Uh, we're going to look at some difficult passages in the scriptures, again, trying to understand what they mean because they, they put God on display and we want to know more about him. We are all theologians. And so when prayerfully thinking, how should we begin this series? Where should we start? I thought, well, the best place to begin would be the gospel. We all talk about the gospel. In fact, here at Rooted Fellowship, we say that it's one of our three things, that we believe God has called us to be gospel-centered. You hear it all the time. If you've been around church for a while, if you've been a Christian for a while, you would hear people talk about the gospel. What is the gospel? Have you shared the gospel? Is this gospel-centered? Is this gospel-saturated? What is the gospel? Some might say the gospel is the, the, the communicating of the, the fact that we are in desperate need of a savior and his name is Jesus. In fact, if we open up God's word, we, we see the, the gospel constantly being communicated, but hear this in different ways to different people. You'll find uh, churches that ha will have on their statement of faith a gospel definition. And I'm telling you, if you go from church to church to church, you'll find a different definition. It says the same thing, but, it, but it's different. It comes at different angles. And so again, it leaves us wondering, well, what, what is the gospel? Here's one that, that blows my mind. Right? Like there's multiple gospel presentations in the Bible alone. I mean, we could go to Acts chapter 2 and see Peter's uh, sermon at Pentecost. I mean, we could look at Jesus and how he unpacks uh, the message of the gospel to different people. But, but for me, the one that, that blows my mind is the one that we find in Luke chapter 23. It's this encounter with, with the, this criminal and Jesus. Jesus is on the cross with two criminals on either side. And here... Here's what happens, verse 39. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. This is Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, don't you even fear God since you are undergoing the same punishment? We are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man, has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Here Jesus' response, he said to him, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. And then that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so again, I go, okay, hold on, but, but what, is, 
what is, what is the gospel? What, like, I, I'm hoping, for, like, I know there should be, like, maybe a bridge diagram and a picture, and on one side, here's this whole thing, here's me, and then, like, on the other side is God, and there's this gap, and I don't know. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's so many presentations of the gospel, and then I read that, and here's this man going, like, remember me. And, and then Jesus goes, okay, today you'll be with me in paradise. So what is the gospel? Well, I thought to kick us off, I would go to a, a well-known piece of scripture, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Romans written by Paul the Apostle. He says this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jew and also to the Greek. There is so much happening here. But Paul, right out the gates, tells us that he is not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Uh, the Greek word translated power is uh, dunamis, the word from which we get dynamite. And so Paul wants us to see that the, the gospel indeed is incredibly powerful. He's not ashamed of this gospel that is incredibly powerful. But again, I ask, what is the gospel? What is this gospel that possesses such power? Well, let's first establish that the gospel, the word gospel means good news. And it appears about 93 times in the Bible, exclusively in the New Testament. So I asked the question, if the gospel means good news, then what is this good news? I put to you the gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to earth, lived a perfect life, died a criminal's death for our sins, and rose again eternally triumphant over Satan and the dominion of darkness, so that there is now no condemnation for those who believe in him as Lord and Savior, but only everlasting joy, and that one day he will come back to make all things new. The gospel. But still, I feel like that's a mouthful. I mean, it's all good stuff, but, but honestly, is there a way that you could simplify that? Because... That's not what the criminal got. That's not what he said. And yet, Jesus says to him today, you will be with me in paradise. So what is the gospel? See, I, after reading and reading and reading, I've come to this conclusion. That the greatest good of the gospel, hear me, the greatest good of the gospel, I don't necessarily think is forgiveness. I don't think it's justification. I don't think it's propitiation. That is a real word. I, I don't even think it's eternal life. As good as those things are, I, I don't think that that is the gospel's greatest good. I don't think that that is, that is the, the greatest good of the good news. But, but rather, I believe the highest, fullest, deepest, sweetest good of the gospel is God himself. Amen. Let me say that to you again. I believe the highest, fullest, deepest, sweetest good of the gospel is God himself who is enjoyed by his redeemed people. You see, for any of those things that I mentioned to you, justification, forgiveness, eternal life, for, for any of those things without God are worthless. I would go as far as to say they're hell. Without God, they are hell. I believe this to be true because of what Philip says in John chapter 14, verse 8. 
that Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's, he's, he's talking about the fact that he's, he's going to go to the Father and, and, and he's just unpacking all of this, this stuff. And, and, and Philip, in that conversation, goes, Lord, show us the Father and that's enough for us. Other translations say it this way, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Show us the Father and that will be enough. Why does, why does Philip say this? Well, let me go all the way back to the beginning. See, when God created man and then breathed life into his nostrils, the first thing that man saw when he opened his eyes was the face of God, the face of the Father. The, the intimacy there, the, the, the love, the, the fellowship and, and, and so Philip goes, okay, I, th I think I get it. I think I get Jesus. Why? Show us the Father and then that'll be enough. The gospel is the good news that God bought for us the everlasting enjoyment of himself. Amen. And he made this possible. God made this possible. How? Through his son. That's how he makes it possible, through his son, Jesus Christ. That at its, at its basic level, I believe that to be the gospel. Amen. Now, my hope is that you would ask the question, okay, Oni, I hear you, and I think I'm tracking with you. So how do we attain this everlasting joy with the Father? I've already mentioned it, it's through the Son. This is why Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the what? To the Father. Again, he's, he's, he's pointing us back to the Father. No one comes to the Father except through me. That your longing, your, your, your very longing is to be with the Father. Even if you're sitting here and you go, I, I don't, I've never thought about that. I've, I'm telling you now, your heart beats for the Father. Amen. You just don't know it. And so you, you find yourself running to all these other things. And Jesus comes and he says, there's only one way to the Father. And it's through me. Jesus is the pathway to everlasting joy with the Father. Without him, we have no access to the Father. Where you hear people going, no, 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 you know what, there's multiple ways to get to God. No, there isn't. There isn't. Without him exists a dividing wall of hostility between us and the Father. Why is this wall hostile? I'm glad you asked. And I'll get to that in a moment. But I, right now, I need you to realize that the good news is that in and through Jesus, there is a way to the Father. There is a way to everlasting joy. The gospel is the good news concerning Jesus Christ who provides a way to salvation, a way to the Father. Now, at this point, we should have so many questions. I hope you do. And at the top of that list should be, if Jesus is the good news, remember we're trying to break this down to its basic basic, basic level, if Jesus is the good news, then oh no, that implies that there is bad news. Yeah. Like, I, guys, I know, I know some of you guys, and I've been walking with Jesus for a while, Oni, get to the, get to the like, the tertiary stuff, the PhD stuff, like, no, 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 my, my fear is that we, we, we do that, and, and, and it, like, we, we, it leaves us wondering, like, we don't even understand the basics of the gospel. But, but hear this, if Jesus is the good news, then that implies that there is bad news. I think sometimes, even in our sharing of the gospel, it can be a little bit like this. It's like randomly tackling someone, like tackling them to the ground. And then, like, you, you both get up, and this person is like, what on earth? Like, what just happened? Like, hey, why did you tackle me to the ground? And then our response is, I just saved you. I mean, the, the following question, but if they don't, like, do something violent to you, um, the next question would be, you saved me from what? 
And sometimes I feel like that's our gospel presentation. Like we just show up to places and we're just tackling people. And they're like, we, man, saved you. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> the key to understanding the gospel is to know why it's good news. We must know and understand. We have to understand and know the bad news. It has to be clear in our minds. And the bad news is this. Paul writes this in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. He says, all of us fall short of the glory of God. Right there. You want to know what the bad news is? There it is. It's that all of us fall short of the glory of God. All of us. But why does the glory of God even matter? Right? I'm just, I'm, guys, I'm letting you in to how I prep sermons. I'm just ferociously asking the text questions. Right? It's like all of us fall short of the glory of God. Okay, great. Why does the glory of God matter? Why should it matter to me? Why should it matter to us? Well, for that, I'll take us to the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Why does the glory of God matter? Well, it's because everything that we see, everything that we experience was created by God himself. And so therefore, he is worthy of glory. Amen. He is worthy of all glory. Why does it matter? Because he is the creator of all things. Amen. Psalm 19 verses 1 to 4 says this, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard, yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. We are developing telescopes that, that, that are looking into the universe and still we're going. We still, we still haven't scratched the surface and God created all of that. We are in awe and wonder of, of, of everything, the, the solar system and the stars. We're in awe and wonder, and, and God spoke that into existence. Why does the glory of God matter? Because he deserves it. Let me explain it this way. I, I have a, a deep reverence. Right? I know that that's a big word, biblical word. It's not a word that we use every day. Like, I don't walk around going, I have a reverence for the police. No, no, it's, but, 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 but reverence, uh, it, it means uh, awe and, and respect, and, and there's, there's honor given there. I, I have a deep reverence for the ocean. I, I just do. I'll go to the beach, and I'll, I'll stand there, and I'll, I'll just look at the ocean, and just kind of look at how the water just keeps going on and on and on. And even as the, the waves come in, like I'm, I'm just, I'm blown away by it all. Fully aware that at any moment, the, the, the water could, could not just swallow up the, the sand where I'm standing, but literally move into the, the streets and the homes, like in the form of a tsunami. Like I'm, I'm aware of that. I'm aware of the, the depth of the ocean that there are places that we haven't yet discovered, Amen. that God has, has created little tiny things that live there and we haven't discovered them yet. I'm just, I'm, there is a deep reverence for the ocean. There is glory there. Now the temptation would be to remain on the water and forget the one who holds the water in his hands. Like as much as I'm blown away by it, it's like, well, God, God holds that in his hands. That the waters obey his every word. That I could be caught up in a storm and God just goes, stop. Amen. Now, if you think that even that explanation to try and explain why God deserves all the glory. If you think that that's still on a, a little lacking, 
then I would say to you that you are right. In fact, any attempt for me to fully unpack the glory of God would fall short. We could get the greatest scientist in the world, the, the greatest astrologist, the, and he, they would come and put on like slide after slide after slide of, of just the universe and talk about just the beauty of how God put all of that together, glory, still, still, that wouldn't be enough. See, for us to think that we could capture the glory of God in a single artistic statement is delusional at best and vain at worst. To squeeze what is infinite into what is finite is immeasurably more impossible than trying to cram an entire fully developed African elephant into a coffee cup. And I feel like sometimes that, that's what we try to do. No matter how gifted you are or how hard you try, it just, it just won't happen. What we will always come up with will always be but a drop in the ocean. And we should never be too arrogant to think otherwise. See, that's my fear for especially a church like ours. That, that we go, no, we've, we figured it out. We figured it out. Can you move on to the next thing? It, it would be like us going to the ocean and, and getting a handful of it and going, I get it now. I get the glory of God. See, the glory of God isn't so much a thing as it is a description of a thing. Glory isn't a part of God. It's all that God is. Every aspect of who God is and every part of what God does is glorious. But even that's not enough of a description. Not only is he glorious in every way, but he is very glory is glorious. Friends, I hope that this is blowing your mind. Like, like it's, it's hard to even contain it to go, no, hold on, Only could you go back again? Could you unpack that? Yes. And some more. God is glorious. Our, our Bibles declare that he is. But we cannot accurately and fully describe in words the glory that Scripture declares. We cannot neatly put into a sentence and capture all that it is. The, the only workable path in some understanding of the grandness of the glory of God is to read the entire Bible from cover to cover. And still, and still, we'll be left in awe and wonder. See, the, the glory of God is not just in one place. It's not just in one chapter. It's not just in one book or in one verse. It's everywhere. It is dripping from every single verse, the glory of God. So when the Bible speaks of God's glory, what is it talking about? Here's my attempt at answering that. The theology of God's glory encompasses the greatness, the beauty, and the perfection of all that he is. The theology of God's glory encompasses the greatness, the beauty, and the perfection of all that he is. That in everything that he is and in everything that he does, God is greater than any human description. Every attribute and action of God is stunningly beautiful in every way. Each characteristic of God and every accomplishment from his hand is totally perfect. This is what we mean when we talk about God's glory. The stunning reality of this universe is that there exists one who is the greatest, the most beautiful, and the most perfect in every way. God is gloriously great. God is gloriously beautiful. God is gloriously perfect. There is none like him. He has no rivals. He has no valid comparisons. He has zero competition. Every part of God is, is glorious. Every part of him is glorious in every way possible. There's nothing more to be said about it. And, and because God is glorious in every possible way, he alone stands in this vast universe as the only one who is worthy of worship, surrender, 
and love of every human heart. He is worthy. He is worthy of it all. He is worthy of every worship, surrender, and love of every human heart. And so when Paul in Romans says, we have fallen short of the glory of God, he is saying, we have failed in our worship of the one who is glorious in every way. He, he's saying that we have failed in our surrender to the one who is glorious in every way. He, he's saying that we have failed in our love for the one who is glorious in every way, every single one of us. I don't care who you are, where you're from, how much money you have in the bank, your accolades, how, how much you know of this. Friends, all of us fall short of the glory of God. But we have to understand, we have to recognize this glory. All of us, all of us, we, we fail because we are all glory thieves. We are all glory thieves. Instead of living for the glory of God, we try to steal that glory for ourselves. And we're very clever about it. Very, very clever about it. Isaiah 42 verse eight. It says, I am the Lord, that is my name. And I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. Why, why will... God not give his glory to another. We could unpack this for hours, but I'll just give you quick three points, three quick reasons to why God will not give his glory to another. The first one we've already covered. God will not give his glory to another because all glory and honor and praise belong to him alone. He gives life. Do, does anyone in here give life? Now, now I know we'll go, yeah, I, I got <laughs> Look at my row. I've, I've given life. <laughs> but, but we're only able to do that because God himself has given us the ability to do that and he did that by first giving life to us. Amen. We don't give life the way God gives life. And we know this to be true. That's why we all have insurance. My hope is that you do. Life insurance and medical aid. And you have all these precautions because you're just like, I just don't know. I don't know. I'm not in control as I, as I think I am. So, you know, I just, I, just in case. God needs no insurance. No life policy. No medical aid. This is why he will not give his glory to another. Why would he do that? God will not give his glory to another because it is immoral, we all know this, it is immoral for someone to take credit for something he or she did not do. Remember, God created. And I know some of us, someone just quotes something that you said and you're like, oh, how, how dare you? Where's the footnote? Where did you, you must, did you? Uh, but our, our lives. Let me ask the question, are our lives, do, like do we have footnotes everywhere that points back to God, that glorifies him? Do, let's be honest, do we? And again, I've mentioned this before, but, 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 and we'll tackle this in this series, but, but we, we've done this thing where we go, there's my spiritual life, like right now what I'm doing for, for the next 30 or so minutes, this is my spiritual life. There's footnotes everywhere. But the moment I leave here and I get in my car and I go wherever, it's all me. I did this. I got this degree. I saved up this money. We are stealing. We are all thieves, glory thieves, each and every one of us. Third reason that God will not give his glory to another is because he alone is king. He alone sits on the throne, not you and I. We try to, but it's, it's, like, it's like a kid trying to sit in a seat that is way too big for uh, him or her. It starts off funny, and then after a while, it's like, this, I'm uncomfortable. And then it moves from like, I'm uncomfortable, like, this is just wrong. But that's you and I. It's like, no, God, hold on. Let me sit. You can have, like, everything else, please sit on the throat, please, you know? But when it comes to my relationships, just hold on. Just could you, 
could you shift a little bit? Uh, and then you write up your own thing and then you say, hey, could you just co-sign on that? <laughs> because I know what I want. I know what I need. Yeah. And maybe for, relation, for relationships, you're like, no, God, you sit on the throne. When it comes to relationships, God is going to provide. But when it comes to finances, it's like you find yourself a little bit too close to that throne. A little bit too close. God is king. He is ruler of all. And he alone sits on the throne. That is why he will not give his glory to another. And despite all of this, we still demand to be the center of the universe. We take credit for what only God could produce. We want to be sovereign. We want others to worship us. We establish our own little kingdoms and then we punish those who break our laws. We tell ourselves that we're entitled to what we don't deserve. This isn't fair. No, I get that. I, I get, like when we say that, I, I totally understand what you mean. But to stand before a holy God and to go, this isn't fair. You want fair? Do you really want fair? We complain and grumble all the time. And friends, this is a glorious disaster. Glorious disaster. This wickedness is punishable. And the penalty of this is spiritual death and separation from God to dwell in the place of eternal judgment. That's what we deserve. If you're crying out for fair, then that's what we deserve. I'm just, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being honest. All of us fall short of the glory of God. And sometimes we don't want to have these conversations because it's like, man, I'm, I don't know if, if I say this, like, I don't know if I'm going to be liked at the office. Like, I don't know if my friends are going to still want to hang with me, but but it's the truth. And so many of us, I, my fear is, is that we're, we're not telling the truth. We're not even telling ourselves the truth. Oh, God, I deserve to be in the kingdom of God. Oh, God, you're so lucky to have me. I mean, have you seen your people? Like, Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. This is bad news. It's bad news. But there is good news. There is a gospel. There is good news that despite our disaster, there is a way out. And that is found in the second person of the Trinity. The way out is found in God. The way out is found in God, in his son. John chapter one, verse one says this, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John is, is, is introing Jesus, and he starts by going, hey, I just, wanna, I just wanna make sure that you guys all understand that Jesus, Jesus is God. He's the second person of the Trinity, in the beginning. If you jump Forward all the way to verse 14, it says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory. The glory as the one and the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Paul writes in Romans chapter 9, speaking of Israel's selection as the people of God. Again, something we'll cover in this uh, series. What does that all mean? But he speaks of Israel's selection. He says from verse four, they are the people of Israel chosen to be God's adopted children. God revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them and gave them his law. He gave them the privilege, whew, the privilege. He gave them the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promises. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are their ancestors. And hear this, and Christ himself was an Israelite as far as his human nature is concerned. And he is God. Amen. The one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Paul says this to the church in Colossae. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 to 9 says, Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from spiritual powers of this world. Friends, even this is found in the church. We can read that text and go, yeah, 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 you know, 
Paul's warning us about those people out there. They're in here. Where, where, where we go to the ocean and we go, ah, I've got it. And then you show up and you're like, I'm going to tell you about everything, about the glory of God. Not realizing that the water is slipping out of, your, and then you realize this and you go, oh, it's, it's, I, I don't have it, I don't have it. Now I need to start making up stuff. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in human body. What we cannot contain in our minds and our hearts with our eyes, we're told that all of it dwells in Jesus. What, like, we should just take a praise break here. Like, we call the band up, we sing a couple songs, we're just in awe. Like you're saying, okay, the, the glory of God, like we can't contain it. We can't, and then we're told that all of it dwelt in Jesus. It should make us pay attention to who Jesus is. What did Jesus say to Philip in response to his question? He says, show us the Father and that'll be enough. What, what, is, what does Jesus say to Philip when he says, in a sense, show, show us the glory. Show us the Father and that'll be enough. Show us the glory. What, what, how, does, how does Jesus respond? John 14, verse 9 says, Jesus replied, I have been with you all this time. Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Amen. Show us your glory. It, like, think about it. They're all standing there like, oh, show us your glory. Show us your glory. And Jesus goes, I'm, I'm right here. I'm, how have you missed? Oh, it's because all of us fall short of the glory of God. Amen. All of us fall short of the glory of God. Jesus says, your sin forbids you to see the glory of God. But God has made a way for you and I to see it. And that is by first seeing Jesus. That, that, that's how it works. Romans 3, verse 23 to 24 says this, for everyone has sinned. And you are included in that everyone. We all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through who? Christ Jesus, when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. See, friends, the remedy to our calamity is found in and through the person of Jesus Christ. The remedy for our calamity is found in and through the person of Jesus Christ. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish and have eternal life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Colossians 1, 13 to 14, he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. In him, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Where do I find forgiveness? In him. Where do I find redemption? In him. The good news is that in Jesus Christ, we find our, you ready? Our justification, our election, our salvation, our adoption, our sanctification, our redemption, our propitiation, our atonement, our purification, our reconciliation, our restoration, our regeneration, our faith, and our glorification. Amen. And friends, I'm pretty sure I left out a few. Like I, I was just listing as many as I could as I'm blown away by the fact that in Jesus we get all of this. You might be sitting here and asking, on a, why, do any, why do any of these things matter? Like you've just, long list, beautiful, but like glory of God, I get it, like, but, but why? Like, I love Jesus, Jesus loves me, isn't that enough? Like I'm done, I'm good. Why, why does any of this matter? I'm all good. And I would say, yeah, it's true, 
But a lack of understanding of these things, I believe, is like having a membership with a rewards package, but not enjoying any of the benefits because you don't know them. And so on one hand, I'm going, I'm trying to find the simplicity of the gospel. And I also want to understand all these other incredible things. Like, it, it, it's not one excludes the other. And I've seen that. I've seen it happen in churches. It's like, no, 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 we just, man, it's all about just Jesus. That's like, forget all this other stuff. And I've seen other churches where it's like, no, no, no. It's like, you need to make sure that you have all your doctrines in place and in order, and they must all rhyme with three points. Have you done your systematic theology? Have you done that? Do you know Wayne Grudem? If you don't know Wayne Grudem, then I don't know if you're saved. Like, I, I just, I, I don't know. I, like, it's, it's all of it. Be, because it's all in Jesus. Let me, let, let me try to explain it. And I'll be brief. See, the, the doctrine of regeneration, which is us becoming a new creation, it's a beautiful thing. The doctrine of regeneration creates a culture of humility. Why do you say that? Well, it's because I, I, I'm not the one that recreates myself. I am in desperate need of a savior who does that. And it should in me create a culture, a pattern, a lifestyle of humility. When I get around some people and I go, oh, you've just become a Christian and you're still doing this and you're, oh, this person, like, really? Like, no, no, no. What we're experiencing, we both didn't do. Christ did. Humility. The doctrine of justification, that is God removing guilt and shame. Another way to say it, I hear people do it all the time, justification. Just as if I never sinned. It's really cute, like it's, it, it works. The, the doctrine of justification creates a culture of inclusion. It should. The doctrine of reconciliation creates a culture of peace. The doctrine of sanctification, that I'm being molded and shaped to become more and more like Jesus, creates in us a culture of life. The, the doctrine of glorification creates a culture of hope that one day we, we, we will be glorified with the Father. Hope. Yep. All of this matters. And so on and so on and so on. But look, all of this, the point that I want to make is that all of this is found in the person of Jesus Christ. That everything that I've just shared to you, the fact that we are well, able to, to see the, the, the glory and the beauty of God, the Father, it's... It's all found in the person of Jesus Christ, who all the glory of God dwells. A glory that we have shunned, therefore sinning against an almighty God, alienating ourselves from the very giver of life and joy and placing us in shame, guilt, and condemnation. But God. Two, two words that, like I'm telling you, you tell a story and then you go, but God. That's God intervening. And, and if you're a Christian, you have a but God moment in your life. That there, this is where I was going, but God. This is what I was doing, but God. This is what I was believing, but God. And my fear is that we've just normalized that. Now it's about a list of things that you need to fulfill. But God, in all his glory, makes a way for us to be brought back to life brought back to him because he is life through Jesus who is the good news. He is the gospel. Amen. When Jesus shows up, he is the good news that everything that, that the Old Testament has been prophesying about and hoping for shows up in Jesus Christ. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter four, I'll close on this. Verse one to six. It says, therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this new way, we never give up. We reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. Oh God, would we repent of those underhanded methods. We don't try to trick anyone or distort the word of God. We tell the truth before God and all who are honest to know this. 
if the good news we preached is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They're unable to see Jesus. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. There is, there is so much happening in here. So much happening in here that like, I, maybe, maybe if you're in a family group, maybe this is what you unpack this week. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. Blinded the minds of those who don't believe. And so therefore we are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. And, and so we don't understand. We can't see and we don't understand. This message about the glory, the glory of Christ who is the exact likeness of God. And then he goes on to say, you see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We have no business in doing that because we cannot save anyone. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord. We preach Jesus. And we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness. I love that. Let there be light in the darkness. P Paul here goes all the way back to Genesis and goes, remember when God said, let there be light. He spoke that into the darkness. And that brought life. And so he's saying, would, would that same power, would that same power, would it, would, it be, would it be spoken? God, would you let there be light in the darkness of our hearts? Has made his light shine in our hearts so we could know. Remember, we, we didn't understand, but now so that we might know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. I love how the, the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God, and then he says, the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Friends, the good news is Jesus Christ. And if we preach anything else other than Jesus Christ, then may we repent and turn away from that. I believe the reason the, the, the criminal was saved that day is because he looked upon the face of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. See, God shines light. The light is the glory of God found in the face of Jesus, which is the good news. It is the gospel. And this, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know some of you have been going, oh, yeah, now you want to mention the Holy Spirit. <laughs> right? Like, now, like where, where was the Holy Spirit in all of this? Well, friends, he's there all the time. He's there all the time. I wish I had time, but I don't. But, but just real quick, at creation, we're told that the Holy Spirit, Genesis 1, 1 to 2, we're told that the Spirit hovers over the surface of the water. He's there at creation. In the three Gospels that mention Jesus' baptism, we are told that the Spirit descended like a dove. He's there. You read Romans chapter 8, verse 10 to 11, we're told that, the, that, the, that the, the Spirit of God is who raised Jesus from the dead. He, he is always there. And so God shines light. The light is the glory of God found in the face of Jesus, which is the good news, the gospel. And this, by the power of the Holy Spirit, awakens our hearts. And it awakens our minds so that we might see and believe. And so maybe, maybe this morning, The, 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 the sin and the challenges and the difficulties that you're experiencing is because you've normalized the glory of God. 
You've, just, you've normalized the, the glory of God, that you, you no longer recognize it, and so because you no longer recognize it, you no longer respond to it. Let, let me get in your living room. Let me put my feet on your coffee table for a little bit. The fact that you are not generous is because you no longer recognize the glory of God and you don't respond to it. The fact that you don't share the gospel with other people is because you no longer recognize the glory of God and you no longer respond to it. The, the fact that, that, that you have a greater fear of SARS than you do of the, the, the commandments of God is because you no longer recognize the glory of God and you no longer respond to it. And so this morning, would we repent? In, in whatever area it is for you, would we repent? Would we, would we go, hold on, like, like I've normalized this. I've, I've normalized this to the point where it's like, I'm now sitting in the seat. I'm now sitting on the throne. I am now in control. And my fear is that if you do that for an extended period of time, my, my, my next question to, be, to you would be, like, have you, have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Like, have you, have you looked on the, upon the face of Jesus and like the criminal gone, I, I deserve punishment. I'm supposed to be here, but, but Jesus, would you remember me? Would you remember me? My prayer is that we would be a church like that. A church that, that would that would cry out to the Father and say, show us your glory that is found in, in the face of Jesus. And would that have such a significant and powerful impact in our lives that we would not be the same? My hope is that each and every one of us would leave here completely different to how we came in. Like just, just an awareness, an awareness of the glory of God. Like literally as you get in your car, the glory of God as you get back home, the glory of God and, and, and how I, I'm constantly trying to steal. It's like I'm, like I'm tempted to do that, but Jesus, this is why I need you. I'm in desperate need of a Savior. And so, Father God, I pray now in this moment that each and every one of us, that, that would be the cry of our hearts, that we would be like Philip, that we would say, show us the Father and that'll be enough. And that we would recognize that that in seeing Jesus, we see the Father, that, that Jesus, you are the one who reconciles us back to the Father, that the, the fullness of God dwells in you. Jesus, you came and lived the life that we should have lived, died the death that each and every one of us deserved, a criminal's death. By the power of the Spirit, you, you rose from the grave. And that even right now, you are seated at the right hand of the Father. You're praying for us. Praying for us by name, by circumstance, by challenge, by reality, by everything that we're going through. Would you open up our minds? Would you open up our eyes so that we might see and recognize the glory of God? And then Holy Spirit, help us to respond to it. We ask all of this in Jesus' beautiful, beautiful name. Amen.